Once upon a time, stories of fantasy. People suffering with OCD aren't living a fantasy, even though there are a lot of myths that go around obsessive compulsive disorder. Their stories are real. These are stories from the OCD side. Real people, real stories. Brought to you by FamilyOCD.com and InvisibleWheelchair.com. We want your story. Go to InvisibleWheelchair.com and contact us to tell us your story here. OCD is real. OCD treatments are real. OCD recovery is real. And so are these stories. Well, David, thank you so much for being part of the Invisible Wheelchairs Stories from the OCD side. I, I'm, I'm so glad you're here telling your story. Thank you, Don. I appreciate that. And it's uh, great to be here. So I guess we're going to jump right into it, David. Let's let's talk about your story and your, your journey through this OCD process that uh, so many of my audiences have been through, too. Well, thanks, Don, again, for, for having me here. I'm uh, Dave Culkin. And uh, yes, I, uh, my story, I think, um, begins early in my life, but I really didn't recognize it at the time. And that is that uh, I can even remember as far back as third grade when I uh, would really just be overcome uh, with despair and uh, uh just a, a, a lack of control over something as, as menial and simple as homework. Uh, having um, gone through uh, my parents' divorce at the time and uh, moving to a new town, um, obviously a challenge for any kid, but uh, I just remember breaking down one day when uh, we had uh, this seemingly uh, difficult homework assignment, and I just didn't know how to handle it. And at the time, in the back of my head, I had this sense that something, it's just, is this normal? Is this how my classmates would be responding and reacting at this point in time? Uh, and so that that kept with me, that, that inner voice kept, uh, stayed with me as I uh, progressed through youth and, and uh, young adulthood. And so I, in fact, I would get hints along the way, but never understood what was going on. So for example, uh, there was, uh, when I was a teenager, uh, my, my mother gave me a, a New York Times editorial and it was all about uncommanded thoughts. And it really struck a chord with me because that was the, what I was struggling with. Um, the, my OCD has taken form of uh, mostly, uh, it, it, some people used to call it pure obsessions, but it was in terms of uh, obsessive thoughts about taboos, uh, social uh, uh, restrictions or limitations, or loss of control, such as, and, and that usually physically uh, emanated in terms of checking, constant checking, and then rechecking, uh, which in some corners is considered good. Um, and so I was never really questioned about my behavior and my obsessive thoughts, since they were invisible to others, uh, really just bothered me. And then I would share it with my mother and then she would share resources that she really uh, uh, can only uh, find in public media, such as that Times editorial. Um, so she didn't have the resources looking back to address them either. I would even uh, uh, start getting worried if I were uh, depressed or even suicidal. And so I uh, uh, went to uh, talk to a, uh, a, uh, a doctor, a psychologist, and uh, I remember being kind of threatened about that in terms, or defensive is a better word. And a uh, long story made short would just um, uh, really, uh, I told him my concerns, 
And uh, later on, he didn't tell me this. He told my mother, he uh, basically he said, oh, he's not, he's not uh, depressed or suicidal. He loves himself too much. <sighs> so um, now looking back, looking back, he was right and wrong in, 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 in two different ways. One was that there is, uh, he was right in the sense that there is a selfish component or facet to OCD because you're so focused on obsessions, in my case, obsessions and how I'm gonna to respond to that, that it blocks you off from your loved ones. Um, at the same time, he was wrong in the sense that it wasn't that I was uh, hating or loving myself so much, it was a concern to uh, control and be uh, convince myself that I was a good person. As a result of that experience and others at my home, because uh, mental illness did kind of, um, uh, it, it did uh, show itself in, in my family um, for years, and I still do this, I leave out uh, first person pronouns. Instead of I, me, et cetera, I'll just leave it out to convince myself as a way, a technique, maybe a compulsion to not uh, be so selfish because I know that that's, that component is there. Does it make sense? Not necessarily, but that, that's also another facet that I've found, at least an OCD that manifests in my life. As we went on, as I went on, I joined uh, the military. I, I went to West Point, um, became an army officer, and that turned out to be a very good selection because of structure. Uh, things are laid out. It reduces, it removes variables. And so when you do things that you're told to do in a way that you're told to do it, it provides at least some temporary comfort. And so yet again, I would found myself in an environment that was controlled that basically kept my OCD hidden or at least uh, invisible to others except myself. And again, at this time, I didn't know I had OCD. I just knew that I tended to overthink things. And from my perspective, uh, have some uncommanded thoughts every once in a while that I just couldn't get out of my head. So life happens. I graduate from West Point, uh, go to my first military station in, in uh, Kansas, uh, and meet my uh, who, who, uh, Michaela, who became my best friend and then wife. And uh, we finally, um, uh, uh, we marry. And, uh, and so by probably about the sixth month of marriage, and that by that time, we're also getting ready to move. We're starting to realize that there are some things, those uncommanded thoughts, those compulsions of writing lists, so uh, I have to communicate them to my wife because somehow I convince myself that if I don't communicate everything to her, then my uh, loyalty is not with her and that eventually our marriage would break up because of the lack of communication and trust. Then uh, we realized together that there was something off with me. So we went to, to another psychologist but this wasn't for me. This was for her. She was continuing uh, some treatments and follow up with him. But she just uh, brought me in and, and mentioned the uncommanded thoughts. And within uh, two minutes, he gave me this brochure on OCD. And, and, and we didn't think anything of it. Uh, again, I was in the uh, beginning of my career. I was an aviator, which means that... Uh, it's very technical oriented. Uh, checklists are involved. Uh, you do things by the numbers and in a particular sequence. Again, very comforting for someone like me who finds solace and comfort in those um, that control, that structure. Uh, so to fast forward and just give a more Reader's Digest version, <laughs> realize that um, as we grew in our marriage, we realized more and more that my obsessions and then my compulsions that manifested in terms of hour-long briefing sessions to Michaela about my day, 
um, minute written or handwritten brief lists to accompany those. Um, the, um, the particular scripts that I had to hear her say to feel comforted in my, in, in my role as a husband, all of these things uh, just grew and grew as we went along in our marriage and the increasing demands with our response, increased responsibilities. So as a result, by the seventh year of our marriage, we came to a point where something had to give. We both loved each other. We realized that we had to uh, really come uh, to a consensus on what to do next because something had to be done. Michaela was struggling with just, uh, she loved me, but she knew as she claimed later, he's broken. You know? <laughs> and aren't we all? Yeah. <laughs> and we laugh about that. We laugh about that now. But at that point yeah. in my youth, I thought I was a pretty good catch. And, and, and so that was, uh, that was a, a trigger moment for me, one of many. And then, um, uh, then as we sat and we talked with uh, professionals, we, we finally met a, uh, a psychologist who really helped us out just by listening and, and really being insightful and telling us the bare truth sometimes the truth we didn't want to hear. Yeah. Um, in that process, I learned that I had this ability to be able to speak or describe what was going on in my mind during some of these episodes. Um, so why I was briefing Michaela, why was I having certain thoughts or responding to those thoughts, those obsessions in certain ways in a compulsive manner? And so uh, we eventually saw that as a gift that uh, we could use to help tell our story to others, to help uh, them uh, understand that they're not alone and that uh, in, in that sense to really uh, find where their voice is, their self agency is, uh, because that's, that's really what we've learned is that, okay, I'm a little broken, who isn't? Um, but we can get through this together and we can figure it out and we can find something that works for us. Is our marriage perfect? No, just like anyone else's. And that's okay. That means it's normal uh, in, in a sense. And, and for us, you know, it, it, everyone has to define their normal and figure out what makes them happy. And so that's where we're at, our phase in life right now. So that, and that's why we felt uh, at a stable point in our lives. I'm out of the military now. I've retired and um, I've, you know, I'm in a new career. And so we were able to sit down and write our book, OCD and Marriage, to, with that intent in mind to, to, to share our story, um, but not just to tell our story and navel gaze, but to really share it with others who are going through similar experiences but unique experiences to uh, really remind them that they can re rewrite their narr narrative uh, of their married life together or their, uh, their, uh, their single life, that they're not alone and that uh, uh, you two can grow uh, from the experience. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, that, that <clears throat> it's a it's a wonderful story. I, I I was taking all kinds of little notes, so I'm not sure what even direction to go with because uh, there's quite a, a lot of complexity to this. You know, uh, well, you know, what I was first wanting to think about is as as you were growing up in your family, how did you see it affect the family, and and how did you, what about your own feel? What did it do to your own? Like your their self esteem and all that, I would imagine was was dented at least with with this what you went through as a child. How did it affect your family growing up? That's a good question. Um, and again, uh, every family is different. In my family, um, it was um, kind of a unique experience because again, it was uh, I wouldn't say hidden. But I, or it was probably a, a better description is uh, uh, apropos to the podcast. It was invisible, <laughs> but it was hidden. I because I hid it. Um, bear in mind that my parents were divorced. I live with my mom and my brother. They were 
uh, not particularly religious. And my dad was a, a very business, a busy businessman. And, and so I didn't really see him often. My mom had some um, mental challenges of her own, which is fine. But the problem was that both of my parents, not only because of their those particular problems, but because of, uh, they grew up in a generation uh, born in the thirties uh, where you just didn't really talk about these things yeah. too often, whether it was sex, mental illness, uh, addictions and so forth. And so when I had questions about those things and what's happening to me, why am I having these thoughts? Um, I got the sense they didn't know how to respond. Their response was, well, we'll send you, we'll set you up a, a, an appointment with the doctor and, uh, or uh, talk to your friends or, or, or find a, an article or a book that referred to that. And so a large part of it, I think I responded by learning on, by my own, on my own. But until I got diagnosed, I didn't have a label to put on. All I had was uncommanded thoughts or these things that enter my head and bother the heck out of me. And so until then, until that diagnosis, and that's really the reason why that diagnosis was such a relief uh, early in our marriage. But until I got that, it was, uh, it was a struggle because I didn't know if I was normal. Okay. I didn't know if I was a good person or a bad person. And so I had a tendency to overcompensate. As an example, um, I would uh, watch, uh, again, taboos. Uh, uh, if I watched a, um, you know, one of those several real crime dramas or documentaries, let's say serial killing. You know, I mean, at that time, you got Manson and all, all these yeah. other characters running around, right? But there were documentaries about them as well. And... I would start finding myself asking myself questions as a young teenager. Well, could I do that? Uh, I mean, I physically can. I can do those terrible things. Would I want to do that? Do I, am I, because I'm thinking about that, does that mean I really want to do that? And because I'm thinking about it, does it mean I'm a bad person? And so forth. And this snowball, this cascade of thoughts would become normal to me. And so I would start avoiding situations that really bothered me. And to this day, we have movies that are not rated D for Dave because of that. <laughs> you know? And yeah. so, and that's a good thing actually. But before I got diagnosed with OCD, I didn't understand the mechanics of it. And that's probably a longer answer to your question, but it really gets to a point of how do you respond in your family when you don't even know what the, what, the name yeah. of the enemy you're facing. Don't, don't have it defined, in other words. Um, okay. one, I've, I've got just one thing I saw out of the book. I, I, you called um, your OCD herb. I, I don't know if it's herb or herb, but I think it's herb. <laughs> but, uh, um, that wasn't after the love bug, was it? No, actually it's <laughs> not. Um, it's, uh, it, it's kind of a, a herb... Uh, my, uh, my mother uh, was a, a great cook, uh, a gourmet sh uh, chef, and she also um, used some of her experiences in France. But uh, uh, my brother and I uh, would always laugh because my parents were sometimes not socially attuned. And so they would, uh, uh, and one of the examples is she would call them herbs, herbs. with a hard <laughs> H. And, but we also had to realize Michaela and myself, my wife and I had to really uh, sit back and label this disease. And we didn't want to call it OCD. We wanted to call it something that had a, hum a humor, humorous tinge to it, but at the same time, something we could target. Well, yeah, because I, I was kind of curious that at one point you, you say in the book uh, that you didn't really want to take OCD too serious. But then at the uh, later on in the book, you said that you saw her, Herb as the enemy. So I was kind of curious as that seemed a little contradictory, but so, so how did you really view Herb and, and did, did that help you? I guess uh, uh, I, I, it did, it did, it did labeling it. And again, it goes back to being diagnosed with something. Now you have a known enemy and you mm. can learn about it. 
And so the first thing I did when I got diagnosed was I went to the library and in my, that was uh, again, the pattern I had established in my life, go to the library and read about it. And that's exactly what I did. And that, that was life-saving because then I, at that time, then I could look at the literature and see, oh, that's what I'm going through. And that was when the light went on that I'm not alone. Um, so yes, uh, to, uh, I guess uh, another way to look at it is uh, you're either going to laugh or you're going to cry. And we just, we chose to laugh. Um, yeah. and, and another trigger event or a key event in our relationship really was when I was telling, sharing Michaela uh, with Michaela, my, one of my fears, and, and I don't recall what it was, but I think it had something to do with uh, maybe murder or something. There's something tends to be either sex or violence or both um, my obsessive thoughts. And, um, uh, you know, she turned to me and said, you know, Dave, you, you worry about doing these terrible things. And there are people out there who have done these terrible things and think nothing of it. And that really put it in perspective mm -hmm. that because my greatest fear was that these thoughts would translate into actions yeah. and, and therefore uh, confirm that I was a bad person. Okay. Well, the, one of the questions I ask and when I do uh, with people telling their stories is, you know, and, and this is kind of an odd question sometimes, but I think it's an interesting one is, you know, were you able to find, and I don't know if the good is the word to use out of it, but something on a more positive basis from OCD. Well, thank you for the question. I, I think, yes, I think we wouldn't be the married couple and I wouldn't be the man I am today without all of my experiences, including OCD. And I, I, uh, I'm a person of faith and I believe that that that's part of the calculus that God put into the, <laughs> into the, <laughs> into the batter, so to speak, when, when he made me, but um has it been tough. Yes. Um, have there been bad times? Oh yeah. Um, but it's, I, I, I look back into, uh, uh, I believe in crucible experiences where if you go through some tough times, you're, you're going to get stronger from it. As long as you go into it with an open mind and an open heart and that, that's so facing my vulnerabilities, um, today, especially is, I think is really important. And we all, we've grown up in a society that doesn't always cherish that facet, that virtue of just facing your own self and your vulnerabilities. Again, not for the sake of, uh, you know, looking at your navel, but really trying to improve yourself to become your mm -hmm. true self and take off those masks of falseness. So in that sense, OCD has forced me to look at myself and those vulnerabilities and address them. Uh, again, I have not been successful with all of them, but, uh, uh, at least I have a better view of it and a, a more clear vision of it. So I would say that's the biggest goodness that's come from having OCD. I, I think it's also forced Michaela and I to have a, a better uh, communication. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, 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 it's not forced, but we are definitely deliberate. So mm -hmm. for example, uh, when we part, whether it's in the morning or go on a trip, we always make sure we say, I love you. And it's not because necessarily, be, of course, we do love each other, but we make a point of saying that because you never know when it's going to be the last time you see us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so that is crucial. Um, and, and so you, you learn to live um, uh, from the point of, am I going to regret uh, if this person dies tomorrow, am I going to regret something I did or did not do uh, to him or her? So those, yeah. those are things that help me focus. And that's what OCD has really helped me to do is focus on uh, the important tasks at hand and prioritize them. That's, that's great. I, I appreciate that. Cause like I said, I, I think it's, I've really learned, uh, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of different, interviewed a lot of people, talked to a lot of people in this process and, you know, to, I, I've seen people look at OCD so many different ways, you know, bully, uh, I had one, one doctor that talked about OCD as the um, overprotective helicopter mom. 
<laughs> so worried about you that it's, you know, it's just reminding you, reminding you, reminding you, reminding, you know, kind of thing, you know, so right. it's neat to get that perspective. So thank you for that. Um, the last thing I was going to ask you is, you know, thinking about somebody that's, you know, just getting into this place, maybe in the marriage or maybe just in finding out about OCD as a single person, what kind of advice would you give them? Well, well, thanks, Don, for that question. Um, again, I, I would say, like anything else, um, if you're getting in, especially into a marriage or a committed relationship, one of the natural things we do is you learn about that person. You you learn as much as you can, um, and and often uh, I, I think we overlook the the mental health issues. Maybe we're embarrassed to mention them, or maybe you mention it, but we just you just stay at the surface. And I think it's so crucial really to learn at a deep level, uh, something that, uh, as insidious as OCD can infect not only someone's life, but also the family and the loved ones around them. Uh, and so um, I think that's my first piece of advice is to learn. And that's one reason why we wrote our book because we found that there weren't too many resources out there especially for people like Kayla, who's, uh, you know, finding herself in this relationship with this, this guy who's seemingly okay on the outside, but has yeah. a lot of turmoil inside and, oh, don't we all, but <laughs> and so, so learning that and, and, and learning to cope with that gives you more tools in your toolkit, so to speak, to, to address that. Um, I would also say that uh, another piece of advice is, you know, we all write our narrative, we all write our story, and we have self-agency in that. Uh, our stories are not all written yet, and um, uh, we have this capacity as human beings to relate to one another and to choose with whom we relate to. Uh, and so, for example, when you get into a committed relationship or marriage, you're choosing to be with that person. Uh, and, and so, um, you owe it to yourself and to that person to share with them what's what's inside of you, what's uh, what makes you tick, and uh, sometimes you can't do that unless you know those the answer, at least some of those questions or have asked yourself those questions. Um, so I think that self agency and voice are important. Um, the voice part leads to respect for yourself and for your partner. And that is so critical to developing trust in a relationship. So I think those are the key things, the key takeaways for me, at least. Well, those, those are great. Uh, uh, those are good advice. Like I said, uh, I'm, I'm doing more and more getting married couples up here because I'm finding, like you said, the, the resources really haven't been out there and they're, they're getting more and more. And I'll, I'll mention again, uh, uh, David's book is OCD and Marriage, Pathways to Reshaping Your Lives Together. Um, and it's by by Dr. David and Michaela Culkin. Uh, I like that. I just noticed the PhD on there. Um, and David, I, uh, thank you so much for being part of it. Because I, you know, I, the the one other thing that I believe you uh, that you're giving to people here is hope. You get into a, a marriage, and it's tough enough as it is, you know. Uh, well, I've been married 27 years and we went through the OCD stuff with our kids and, and it was a battle and a half, you know, and it, there was inches away from divorce at times that felt like, you know, mm -hmm. so giving people hope, you know, that's one thing I think you give is you let them know that your marriage can be a good marriage, even with OCD and even with all the natural struggles you go through with the, with the marriage. So thank you so much. I think you're gonna be an influence for so many people with this. So again, thank you for being part of this. Don, thank you so much for having me. And uh, really, again, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share my story and, and hopefully uh, um, folks will find at least some, uh, like you said, some hope and some a positive future to to this uh, this really this enemy sometimes that seems like an enemy but can also in the journey uh, that's it's 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 not the end point it's just uh, part of the journey so thank you and I'll remind my audience that we will have David and Michaela 
in a future podcast, really digging into the marriage, how it uh, affects both of them, talk about their book. So stay tuned for that. And thank you for being here, audience. I appreciate it. So that is our story for this podcast. Remember, we want your story told here. If you want to tell us your success story, or just want to tell us where you're at, simply go to www.invisiblewheelchair.com. Then click on the Tell Us Your Story on the top left side, or just click the Contact Don button on the right side towards the bottom. We want to give you a voice to your story.